Hello, and welcome to Inside the Scenic Studio. I'm Jared Davis, manager here at the Arlington County Scenery. Uh, right now, I'd like to say hello to all of the Arlington High Schools out there. Um, uh, I guess that's Yorktown, Wakefield, H.B. Uh, Woodlawn, and uh, the, uh, uh, the crew, Washington Liberty. That's right. I can't, can hardly forget you guys. All right. So uh, we're going out, and today we're going to talk about painting wood grain and painting wood grain for the theater. Wood grain for the theater is... Uh, to rustic. And today, because rustic is uh, kind of the easiest uh, version to get across, uh, we're going to demonstrate how to paint rustic wood for the stage. So one of the things that we're going to have to talk about is materials. Um, we're going to have to talk about uh, reasons for doing it uh, the way that we're doing it on, on the stage. You may notice that I have this flat here prepared um, uh, down here on the ground. We're going to be painting on the ground um, instead of up uh, in the air because that is how it's done in the theater and it helps make this technique work. Um, a lot of people find it scary uh, to paint on the ground, um, but it's actually quite easy and I'll show you how in just a little bit. Um, so I think uh, let's, go with the, let's go with our first slide, which is um, the... Uh, Yes, uh, the, well, hang on, I have, a, I have a, a version of it here. This should be our first slide. Uh, and so the first slide is uh, a combination of fancy wood and rustic wood. So the fancy wood, uh, as you can see, is, is on the left. Uh, it's the red uh, sort of cherry kind of a, uh, kind of a wood. Uh, you can see there's lots of wood grain and depth and uh, whatnot that's created illusionistically with the paint. That is, this is all just paint on canvas. It's not actually embossed. It's not actually coffered uh, the way that you see it there. And um, uh, we're going to do a very similar thing on the left, which is this rustic wood, an old barn door. Uh, this is wood that has been, that was once, you know, the color of wood and has over the years turned kind of a gray. Um, and it splits and it uh, 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 sort of uh, becomes weathered. Uh, that's what we're going to go uh, looking for today um, in this demonstration. So let's talk about the materials. Um, first thing we're going to do is uh, talk about the brushes. Um, you can use pretty much any brush, uh, but there are a couple of... Um, uh, couple of the brushes that we're going to use. <laughs> uh, I apologize. I, I, I got the crew behind me uh, uh, waving their hand, arms frantically, uh, but I now realize what I did. Uh, and so uh, there was no cause for alarm, uh, just on my part. Anyway, brushes. These are Purdy brushes. Um, uh, they've actually recently changed brands, um, but they are kind of the, the best thing you can get. You can go for a cheaper brush, but honestly, like, you don't have to be a connoisseur like me to understand how uh, good a good brush is. Uh, when you pay for it and you keep uh, it clean and you keep it well done, you uh, can keep them for years and they will uh, always be very good friends to you. Um, uh, but uh, this is a uh, two inch brush. Uh, you also get uh, smaller brushes. Uh, this is an inch and a half um, uh, and uh, three inch and then we can even go uh, as large as this type that screws on to a broom handle um, that is, I want to say this is six, I mean, eight inch, eight inch brush probably. Um, but anyway, so we're going to have those. Then we're going to be using bamboo. The bamboo, you uh, get maybe some old tiki torches. Sometimes you can find uh, somebody's backyard. You want to season it a little. You got to split it. And then uh, we put these rubber bands on it and... Uh, then, with a little effort, you wind up uh, getting <laughs> getting them into the into the bamboo. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to use that uh, paint. Let's talk about paint. Um, we are using um, theater paint, but we are also using some um, 
some of the regular stuff um, uh, that you'd get from Home Depot. This is uh, theater theatrical paint. It's called, uh, the Roscoe is the brand, and that's, again, sort of the uh, gold standard for theater paint uh, these days. Um, and this is a particularly um, dense version of paint called supersaturated. Um, if you, in broad strokes, the only difference between supersaturated paint and uh, regular off-Broadway, which is the closest to the type of paint that you find at Home Depot, uh, is pigment load. And so there is way more pigment in this than there is in uh, the Home Depot paints. Um, paint is, cons uh, I should uh, back up and say that paint consists of three things, vehicle, binder, and pigment. And uh, so vehicle is the thing that everything is inside. Um, uh, in this case, it's water. Binder is the thing that makes it stick to the wall. Um, uh, and, and in this case, it's basically plastic. Um, and, uh, and then pigment, and again, as we said, uh, this is the uh, high pigment load. Uh, so you can actually make five gallons of pretty good paint out of this little quart um, with the supersaturated. Uh, it's a little more expensive, but uh, it's got some great colors. And, uh, and today's hero is the color Payne's Gray. Payne's Gray is a fantastic, versatile color, uh, and I will be talking at length about it in just a little while. All right, so um, we have an assortment of colors. We have uh, uh, also, uh, I should say I have them in the buckets here. I also have my water bucket. And, uh, and I think that it's one of the things that people don't uh, really appreciate um, about uh, theater paint when they think about painting for theater. It's actually more like watercolor than it is painting a house. Um, uh, certainly there is painting the house. There's room for that. Um, there are certainly lots of things that just need a coat of paint. But if you're doing anything illusionistic, if you're doing anything faux um, uh, 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 or uh, trompe l'oeil, uh, uh, as the French would say, which uh, means fool the eye, um, if you're doing anything like that, um, it's actually going to be more like a watercolor, um, which is great because um, the theater paints have a higher pigment load, which means that you can add water and it will thin the paint out um, uh, appropriately. If you have uh, regular Home Depot paint and you add water, it gets a little gummy and then there's really kind of a moment where it just sort of goes bleh, um, which is a technical term. Um, and so uh, what, we, what, what we then, uh, what, what that means is that water is actually your best friend as a, uh, as a scenic painter. Um, so I've actually got two buckets. I've got my clean water bucket and I've got my, uh, my dirty water bucket. Um, and uh, I'll say that I've pre-wet all of these brushes. Um, you always want to work with a wet brush. Um, it just increases flow. It makes everything uh, run smoothly uh, and whatnot. Um, uh, I think that if you start this and you don't have a wet brush, um, you'll find that your paint skips around and, it's, and it just feels feels like bubble gum uh, instead of a nice, smooth sort of situation. So anyway, um, so that's, uh, that's water, um, and that's paint, and that's brushes. And then we have the support, which is, in this case, a flat. This is a, a standard 4x8 sheet of Luan that is uh, on a uh, 2x3 frame. Um, uh, it's a little irregular uh, in the theater, but these days, uh, wood prices are what they are. Um, we're going to use just uh, any old thing that we found around the shop. So uh, uh, that's that. We have uh, base coated it um, with a coat of regular Home Depot gray paint. And, um, uh, and that's what we're going to do. Um, we're going uh, to paint on this thing. All right, let's get started. Let's actually, well, enough talking. Let's start talking about paint, um, uh, talking about actually painting. So we are going to start doing the rustic wood. The simplest thing uh, that we can do here, uh, let's go with, let's go with this guy, even though, even though it was giving me trouble before. I'm going to see if I can, <coughs> I see if I can fix it. Um, I actually just fixed this one today. 
here's the trick um, that you can do. You take a knife and you tap it on the end of the bamboo and it splits the bamboo, which is what I think I need a little more of because this handle has got a little bit of a uh, wide part in it. Okay, so yes, so very first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna mark out with a, <clears throat> with a, with a gray that is um, uh, the same gray with a little bit of blue added. Um, uh, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna mark out and I, I guess I should also uh, uh, say that this is uh, the procedure for the most part. You have your bucket on the ground. Um, it a, has a little water added to the paint. You dip your brush inside. Then you pull across and flip it over and pull across. Now, nothing is going to drip onto it. Um, uh, no, there's nothing worse than going off onto a piece of canvas or something like that and having it drip uh, and, and what have you. There's plenty of paint that's been loaded into the brush. I've done my, uh, my level best, and apparently not that good, uh, of a job of not getting the paint into the furrow. The furrow is the metal part of the brush. Uh, if the paint gets in here and it dries, it will ruin your brush. I don't know if you can see, but this brush has come to a, a point right there. And it is very, very sharp, very nice, um, uh, is a joy, joy to paint with. Um, all right, so again, we dip. And, and we flip, and then we get ready. So uh, the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to I'm just going to try to locate a couple things. I'm going to go right here on the center line, and this is going to be the top of our lintel uh, of the um, of the doorway of this old barn, and I'm going to do another one of these, and another one of these, and then one of these. We're just trying to find where things are. So there's your lintel. And then we'll go straight down from the edge of the lintel all the way to the floor. And then we'll do the same over here on this, on this one. And just sort of dragging as we go um, on the floor. And then, uh, and then, you know what, let's take this across so that the, so that the um, maybe just a little bit down so that way it's a, it's a, it's a, tr a true lintel. Um, uh, on top of your, uh, your barn. And then we're going to do this. We're going to take and we're going to make, and you know, the, the old barns like this, when you see them, they don't have um, real straight wood anymore. And even when they started, uh, sometimes the farmer just got the cheapest wood available. So uh, the lengths are not necessarily the same length. And so you don't need to worry about it for this. So we're going to just go bang and throw throw a big old board right there and we'll do another board right here. Boom. This is sort of indicating between the boards. And we'll have another one that's about that length. And we'll have one that's sort of like this. And then we'll have one more that sort of splits the difference here. And this is a real horrible joint. I'm sure all the carpenters in the, uh, in the audience are just mortified. Uh, with that uh, with that joint there. That's where the mice get in um, in this old barn. All right, inside the door, um, uh, we're going to do another uh, vertical support like that. And that would, that would be where the hinges would go. And uh, we are not going to deal with hinges today. Oh, no, I have screwed up, but that's OK. Um, uh, we're going we're gonna to keep going. Um, uh, what we can do, because it won't matter, trust me, we are, we're in too deep now. Uh, we're going to do a board on the top and a board on the bottom. Ooh, I'm going to try to get it a little straighter. And, and, then, and then for the fun part, the little Z that goes between, uh, between the two. So, you know, the farmer had, you know, Lurvy go out there and build him a door. Go build me a door, Lurvy. And Lurvy's not that good. He's just good at... Uh, good at putting you know, slop into the pig uh, uh, things. That's for all you Charlotte's Web fans out there. Um, all right, so, so that's, uh, that's, that's where we're at. Now we have our um, stuff start, sort of laid out, um, and we can uh, put that into our, into our clean water and then to, into our dirty water. And what I'm doing here is, uh, is kind of a no-no, um, uh, but for today, for today just because 
Uh, I, I should also add, now that, now that I'm saying it out loud, that uh, this is going very fast. Um, uh, we normally uh, take a good amount of time to do this sort of thing. We're trying to make everything fit into this uh, podcast today, or this webcast, vlog, whatever, whatever it is we're doing. Um, uh, so uh, we may be skipping some steps, or we may be glossing over a few things um, uh, yeah, in the end. Um, but uh, by and large, you should not put your brushes uh, uh, sitting like that, because you'll eventually have a brush that is going sideways, and that's no good for anybody. Um, but it's okay right now. I'm a professional. We're, we're going to figure it out. Okay. So, uh, uh, and and I have some logistical issues. All right. Then let's get let's get one of these big boys out. Again, this is a brush that has been um, that has screws onto the end of a broom handle. Um, you can get these anywhere, but honestly, you can use a purdy. Um, uh, I'm just using this for today's uh, demonstration to keep uh, things moving. All right, our next um, our next color is going to be a yellow ochre kind of color. So we're going to take uh, uh, and dip into the uh, into the yellow ochre, and we're going to put this kind of kind of we're not going to put it everywhere. We're not going to run it all, all over the place, but we are going to kind of turn the brush and start and stop a little bit. And that's going to be kind of how we've been doing, how we're going to be doing things later. But what we're doing here is we're sort of simulating, or what we're doing with the entire uh, project, we're simulating the way that wood works. And wood is made out of trees in case you didn't know. Uh, you all are, are in high school, so uh, I figured you'd learn that by now. Um, uh, trees, when they get cut down, uh, and you look at wood grain, and I guess, you know, let's, uh, let's talk about wood grain. Um, I'm wondering if you could go to uh, this slide, please. So um, when, when trees are cut down, they're sort of bisected and they have uh, uh, grain to them. And the grain, you'll see, alternates between light and dark. And that is the winter wood and the summer wood. Uh, the winter wood, uh, it, it, is, it is cold, and the tree is cold, and it doesn't do a lot of growing. And so uh, the growth that does happen is very compacted. Um, in the summer, things are nice, things are warm. It's a much fatter sort of uh, situation. Um, and so if you look past the grain on these, and th that's what we're doing in this step, is it's not an even all the way across the board. It's, it's, it's got a little bit of variation uh, from place to place. And that's kind of what we're doing right here, is that we're trying to, um, we're trying to simulate that variation um, in, the, in the wood um, uh, as we go. So again, we're going to go, we're going to go and we're going to, drag towards ourselves and start and stop and twist the brush a little bit you know just to give it a just to give it a little bit of a little bit of life and whatnot uh, nobody wants to look at just boring old scenery um, uh, and so this is a this is an opportunity uh, for you to do that uh, but again don't be too don't be too concerned because all of this is going to get obliterated at some point uh, in this process so don't don't get too attached uh, to anything that you do uh, here at this point. All right, and then let's get to the door. Uh, let's do the lintel. And I think let's go from the side and a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You know, just give it, give it a little bit of life. And, oh, and this is the part where I screwed up before. So you know what, let's fix that by doing a big old glob bang see now it's all gone uh all of the uh mistakes have been uh have been what does it look like oh i see and we're gonna, we're gonna do little boards later okay that's fine yeah so that's great uh these boards go these go vertically so let's just locate a couple of these boards you know doesn't really matter Again, it's going to get obliterated in, some, in, in one respect or another. And we do this one here. Bang. And this one here. Badoom. And then we get a little bit more. And 
we do this side over here. Shoop. The sound effects actually help um, uh, in the end. So uh, I hope that you are taking notes on how to do the sound effects. OK, so then we wash our brush out a little bit. And let's now go and do virtually the same thing um, with the darker color so that we've got, we're not filling it in entirely, but we, you know, you can, you can do a little bit of this and that. And yeah, see what I did there? I just sort of filled in all those spots. Uh, and uh, you notice that I'm not really dipping into the brush. Things are getting mixed a, a little bit here and there. We're starting and we're stopping. It's great. You, got, you guys get it. Uh, I can tell. Uh, all right, so we're going to do this a little bit more. You know, and uh, I guess that, that's the other thing, is that this is not the only way to do, to do wood grain. Some people, you know, uh, have uh, what, I, uh, what I call the zebra stripe method, uh, which uh, involves getting that little rocker thing and sort of rock back and forth um, uh, with a rubber, it's a, like a rubber uh, rocker that's got ridges on it uh, and you put the paint down and then you run the rocker over the paint and it makes this sort of zebra stripe kind of wood. Um, you know, this, what I like about this is that you're really kind of feeling the wood and you're really kind of adding a bit of your personality into it. Um, uh, you, get to, you get to think about people like Lurvy in the process and all the field mice and whatnot that live inside this old barn. Um, uh, as opposed to the other one, which is really kind of mindless, in my opinion. Um, but maybe I'm biased because I have been painting for a long time. Um, I have been uh, painting for the theater uh, for, I've been with Arlington County for 22 years, and I had done a good bit of theater in college and in, um, and in high school. Uh, I uh, volunteered a lot with uh, community theaters back in Detroit, from where, where I'm from. And, uh, and I have uh, worked professionally uh, in all sorts of other theaters and, uh, and events and what have you. And it is really interesting to see the variety of things that you have to know how to create in the theater. And uh, you know, some people say, oh, well, everything that you have in the theater, it all looks the same. You know, like uh, uh, once, you, once you learn how to, how to do one thing, you know, you kind of do that. And you always want to expand your knowledge. You always want to make sure that you're always uh, learning something new and doing new things. But uh, one of the reasons that everything sort of looks the same um, uh, is because of, uh, in fact, lighting. Um, I'm going to put this, put this up for a moment. Um, if we can go to our main slide, please. Uh, you'll notice that this has got very harsh shadows on it. And it's like, whoa, like why, why the harsh shadows, man? Well, um, because theater, you are trying to match the environment that the, these are going to be shown in. And theater lighting is very harsh and very direct. And so that's why this uh, works. You would not do something illusionistically painted like this this intensely um, uh, if you were doing it at home, uh, you know, if you wanted for some reason a faux painted rustic door in your kitchen, um, you would not make it this um, uh, uh, this uh, contrasty. Um, uh, but for the theater, perfectly fine. Um, I am now looking at all of this and say, saying, secretly saying to myself, "My, this is soupy, and it's going to make <laughs> it's going to make the uh, next uh, the next phase a little bit difficult." But we're uh, we're going to get there. Um, OK, so now we have our panel that has been painted uh, in this way. And uh, again, I'm regretting not having a fan or something <laughs> uh, to be able to make, the, to, make this, uh, to make this go faster. But uh, if I wax poetic about wood for uh, some time, it'll give us a chance uh, for, the, for the, the, uh, the paint to dry. Um, so our next step is going to be to let's go with um, let's go with this slide here. 
So this is this is the wood grain options. Um, uh, this is a little handout that uh, uh, was created that shows different types of wood um, uh, wood graining techniques. Um, and our next step is going to be to try to apply the these uh, wood graining techniques um, uh, on to different spots in the wood. Um, you can see that there is uh, uh, a sort of a loop shape, um, uh, almost a figure eight. Um, uh, there is, uh, if you look at the second one in, or the one in the, uh, in the middle column uh, on the top, you'll see that it's uh, a skinny line, and then it gets fat, and then it goes back up, and then the next one is skinny, and they're tight together, and then a fat line, and back up, and then skinny, and a fat line, and back up. Those are um, simulating the way that the wood grows when it's on a branch, um, uh, when it gets cut uh, at the sawmill. Um, similarly, uh, the, sometimes the planks get cut in half and off to the side, as you can see in the next column. Um, where there is a knot, that's where usually where a branch uh, was coming out. So uh, center of loop uh, uh, one here, uh, you can see also has that kind of a, that kind of a, a, a thing. And then lazy, not so straight, skinny, and fat. Um, uh, that's just a long way of saying that things are mostly straight um, uh, all the way across. Uh, Jared, um, we have a question from Ashley. Uh, she wants to know if you can ex expand a little more on heart grain wood. What exactly does heart grain wood mean? Heart grain, yes. Well, uh, th that's in fact what we're going to be doing right now, which is, which is that uh, about 75% of any wood plank that you see is going to have straight lines. Uh, and that what we're going to be doing is the heart grain, which is the inside of the tree. Uh, it, it is, in fact, a lot of the things that you see here, um, where the heart grain is, uh, you think about it sort of like the heart of a person, uh, the inside, it's sort of the inside of where a branch would be growing um, inside of a, uh, of a piece of wood. Um, and, uh, and again, once you sort of see this, and you go walking around in life, I tell you, you'll be, like, you'll be looking at wood and be like, aha, that's, uh, you know, heart grain or, 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 or whatever, or uh, skinny, not fat, uh, uh, and, and all the other things. Uh, one of the other things that you notice, uh, that I've noticed, uh, is that when you look at a piece of plywood, um, you'll see that it's the same uh, grain uh, repeated. And that's because uh, when they create plywood, they actually peel the tree um, with a giant blade um, on its side, and it rotates, and you get the same grain uh, uh, as it's essentially rolled out like some kind of like pumpkin uh, spice roll cake. What do you call those? Yeah, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Ashley, you let me know in the chat uh, what those are called. Um, all right, sounds good. Let's, let's get to painting. Um, uh, it, it's going to be a soupy mess, and we're just gonna we're just gonna roll with the punches here. Um, uh, let's go with this brush. So this is the this is the inch and a half, um, two inch, uh, probably inch and a half. Um, it's an inch and a half. Uh, again, a pretty brush. It's uh, got a nice uh, nice uh, sort of straight tip to it. I'm going to get it a little bit wet, and then we're going to get the magic paint called. Payne's Gray. So there are basically two paints uh, in theater that are magic. Payne's Gray and Van Dyke Brown. Payne's Gray is uh, almost a purpley black, um, if that makes any sense. Um, the purpley black is great because what it does is that you can, you can thin it down, and because it's got blue in it, and the way it does, and black, sort of a blue-black, a little bit on the purple side, but like on the, more on the, I guess you kids are too young for grimace, but on the grimace side of purple, um, uh, if that makes any sense. Uh, that is, I'm sorry. So this gets back into watercolor painting. Um, so in watercolor painting, what you're trying to do is simulate the environment and simulate the sky. You actually take Payne's Gray, um, uh, and when you have a shadow, you can put that down, and the, the thinned out pigment has this sort of blue-black, and 
inside of shadows, I know this is going to get a little bit metaphysical here, but inside of shadows is usually the color of the environment that it's in. So often on a bright day, if you look at the shadows, they're not just black. They're a little blue-black because they're reflecting the sky. Um, uh, uh, all the lighting nerds out there are, are, are nodding their heads. Um, uh, if you've ever had two gels uh, and the shadows of uh, somebody crosses, you'll see that, that if you have a red and a blue, uh, somebody has a shadow, you look at the shadow, uh, there'll be a blue shadow in the red light and a red shadow in the blue light. Um, uh, it's, it's basically the same principle. In any event, that's part of the magic of Payne's Gray. Uh, Van Dyke Brown is a whole different thing. Um, uh, it is also like black, but it is a brown that you can keep adding water to, and it just gets browner, which is nice uh, <laughs> uh, in that case. And the reason that we're going with Payne's Gray is because um, uh, in this uh, sort of scenario, the wood, as it ages, gets grayer and grayer and grayer and grayer. And so uh, this uh, is going to be, this step is going to be a very concentrated version of um, Payne's gray um, uh, because, again, you can thin it out like nobody's business. Uh, kick my bucket to the side here. All right, so let's go for the gold here and try to figure out uh, how we're going to do the driest section uh, <laughs> of any of this. Um, let's go with a, a simple knot. We're going to do one right in the middle. And so, okay, look, there's a knot. And there's a knot. You know, it's a knot. Uh, you know, something like that. And then we're going to do a heart grain. Um, we're going to do... Uh, we're going to take, put it down, and then we're going to come down and come up so that it is very thin and then down like that. And similarly, we're going to come up, press down, and back down close together and thin. Does that make sense? All right, so let's do that again. But this time, we're going to go a little higher, a little fatter, and then close to the other one. Kaboom. And I apologize, it is very soupy. Um, it's one of the problems with trying to do things in a short amount of time. Uh, and so then we're going to match that out there. Sure, fine. And then we're going to do an even bigger one. Let's actually extend that up a little bit so that it's so that it's a little bit nutty. Yep. Okay. And down like that. And then we we'll do one more that's just sort of big and kind of goes off the board. And that's going to be what it is. Okay. So that is that is uh, not the most accomplished one I've ever done in my life, but uh, the, but there we are. Um, Okay, and so then uh, let's, do, let's do another one, which is uh, the simple running off the board. Uh, we're going to pick, and, oh, and I should also say that we're going to take and do a little bit of this every so often. So again, about 75% of it is going to be just straight, but 25% um, uh, needs uh, heart grain uh, sort of wood. So let's do another one. Um, let's do... Let's do the, what were we doing? The off to the side. So we pick a spot and comes off to the side and then back down straight. And then, okay, kind of have it, have it connect. Oh, so soupy. Oh, my goodness. Oh, okay. There we go. And then down and off to the side. And then we do this again. And then soupy and then off to the side. <laughs> and then off to the side. Like a simple sort of sort of thing. And in fact, that gives you an idea of sort of what we're looking for here in this plank. Um, so there's that. Uh, let's do another one. Let's see. Uh, uh, 
let's go, let's go into in in here, and we'll do a little one. So like that. widen it out and so we're basically just sort of going coming down pushing out and then back down and that gives us another another heart grain uh, kind of a look okay uh, and let's do another one we'll do one on the lintel uh, which is let's do uh, sometimes I like I I like to look at things for inspiration. Um, okay, so let's do let's do a big old knot like this one, like, like this one here. So this knot, and then oh, I guess, uh, yeah, okay, that's fine. We'll do a big knot, and then they come in, and then they kind of run off. Boom, come in and kind of run off. Come in and kind of run off. Uh, they come in and sort of terminate there. Come in and terminate there, and terminate there, and and terminate into the into the grain, and then they kind of come off like this. Let me try this higher. And off like this. And off like this. And. And off. All right. So yeah, uh, that's also that's also not the uh, the. I, I apologize. The soupiness is really uh, is really getting to me on this one. Um, uh, let's see. Um, we can do another one, which is kind of a variation on that right here. Uh, we'll do it on this on this guy here, which is. Uh, so it, this one's got uh, got a two uh, two hump kind of situation, like it was two branches. That were coming together. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I guess let's do one more. Which one have we, haven't we done? Oh, uh, we haven't done just a a, a straight. Um, you know what? Let's let's add a little. Let's add a little to this one. Yeah, like there's another there's another knot kind of a situation. Right here. Um, let's do one over on this side. That is uh, running off. Uh, straight, so basically, big grain kind of inches its way out and then kind of comes out to nothing, and big grain inches its way out and kind of out to nothing, and we're going to need a more more paint. Big grain inches its way out. I twist the brush and out to nothing again, and a little bit of that, and then one on the inside here. Just to give it a little bit of, a little bit of this and that. All right, and what the hey? Let's just do another, let's do another one right here, where we're just doing a old-fashioned knot. So we're gonna. And I'm really pressing down on this, giving a nice wide sort of situation. Okay, so then let's just for giggles uh, now go and line, uh, put a line everywhere there is a um, everywhere there is a plank. Now, uh, Jared, uh, we have another question in here. Uh, oh, sure. They're asking about um, how uh, do you know how much pressure to use on the brush when painting? How do you judge that? Right. Well, it's mostly experience, um, uh, uh, but 
uh, you'll get a feel for it. Um, uh, I think that that's the biggest thing that people um, who are new to painting uh, on the floor and what have you um, is uh, you've got to kind of think about the end of the brush and uh, what shape it makes depending on how far you push in, how uh, straight you have it as you're, as you're going. Um, if you have it very flat, it creates a, a much wider sort of thing. Um, uh, uh, again, if you've got a lot of water in here, which again has been the theme of today's uh, show, uh, is that it creates a lot of flow, which is great, um, but, uh, but uh, can definitely uh, affect your drying time. Um, I should also say that, uh, that uh, maybe you've been watching, um, but you know, I'm moving around a lot while I'm, uh, while I'm doing this. Uh, I'm not just standing in one spot doing this because you only have this much uh, reach. You actually, it's sort of a dance. You've got to dance back and forth while you're, while you're doing your, um, uh, your thing. Um, uh, and you're primarily pulling towards yourself when you do it. So that's a nice straight line right there. Um, uh, uh, and I'm, I was moving my body uh, as well as my elbow. Uh, you see I'm sort of pointing my finger. Um, uh, basically wherever your finger is is the end, where the end of the brush is going to go. So um, that's a way to think, think about it. Um, but uh, basically you do one good um, uh, fake wood grain floor and uh, you'll, you'll have the hang of it. No, don't, don't you worry. Um, so there's a set designer out there waiting for you to give you your chance. To do that. So right now we're uh, just going to do all the lines um, uh, for all of the wood in the different spots um, to give us uh, a little bit of a delineation of where the planks are versus where they aren't. And we'll just keep keep on keeping on. Are there any other questions, I suppose, while I'm doing uh, all of this? Well, um, I am, I have, uh, again, been in the park for 22 years, and I have made a lot of scenery for a lot of places and a lot of shows. And I'm currently working on um, Singing in the Rain for the Arlington Players. Um, uh, and there is going to be a lot of folk painting in that show. Uh, and I know that all of the folks at the uh, Arlington Players would be happy to have uh, you folks come out and volunteer to help paint some of that scenery. Um, a few years ago over at Wakefield, we did Chicago, um, uh, which... Uh, uh, had a, a bit of painting and whatnot in it. Um, not a lot of fake painting, a faux painting that is. But um, but definitely uh, that and uh, uh, everybody remembers Mamma Mia over at uh, over at uh, Yorktown um, as well. So let me just pop these in. All right. our diagonal board and our bottom board and sawdust on me. All right, and then the end of our lintel and then the end of our door and one last piece right here. Whew. Okay, so now it's been sort of uh, rustic wooded um, with the heart grain. Now we're going to go with a secret sauce to this project, which is uh, the cut brush. So this is a chit brush, uh, C-H-I-T, which is, uh, I believe, uh, because they were sort of stamped out uh, in the factory into chits. Um, so this is a chit brush that I have cut uh, that you may be able to see, you may not. Um, I'll try to get a little closer. Uh, uh, the um, I've cut the pieces of uh, of the uh, brush here, of the fibers, um, uh, to simulate um, wood 
wood graining. This is the straight part that I was telling you about before. So we take, uh, take that, and put it down. Another thing that, uh, another advantage of the scene shop is that you can, uh, what they call it interviewing the brush, you can interview the brush on the ground and see what it's going to look like before you uh, commit it to the, um, to the paint, to the painted surface. All right, and so then we're going to go on this blank one here and we're going to do an airplane landing. So that means the, uh, it's going to come down and it's going to do a little touchdown and we're going to twist it ever so slightly and rock it back and forth and then airplane take off um, on the end. So that way you're not, you know, you don't slam it down and then, you know, drag it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There is a place for that, but not necessarily. Oh, you know what? And before we do that, let's do, a, let's do something that's relatively fun uh, first, which is we get a, uh, load the brush up a good bit and then we're going to do a, a little spatter. So that is just literally flinging paint into onto the surface. It creates a little bit of a sort of a knotty look, um, a little bit more weathered, um, and it's going to uh, be another step that we do later. But let's just do the, that right now. It gives it a gives it a little jazz uh, in the process. All right. So then, airplane landing, come back down, and we're actually going over the heart grain. Uh, that we painted, and it actually, it actually will look uh, will look pretty good later on. Um, uh, so I don't want to, I don't want you to get scared. Uh, so again, airplane landing. We we twist the brush a little bit, um, just to make sure that it's not a monotonous sort of like the same thing over and over again. Uh huh. Gonna need to reload. Jared, yes. Uh, what would you say are the most preferred services to paint on? Well, uh, that depends. Um, the the best surface to paint on uh, is, if is muslin um, uh, that has been properly prepared. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of places that properly prepare it anymore um, uh, because properly prepared uh, uses animal glue um, uh, in on the um, on the surface. Uh, to fill in the holes, um, uh, but it is a dream to paint on. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it's difficult to get the animal glue and uh, and all that. But a close alternative these days is a little bit of white glue uh, and um, and some water, and uh, you get a pretty good sort of um, uh, analogous surface. Um, but by and large, uh, these days, Luan is king. You're going to be painting on Luan more often than not, and that is in fact what this surface is. Luan is a, a very thin plywood that um, they used to say was made out of mahogany, but there's all sorts of alternatives nowadays. Uh, if you go to Lowe's, they have this weird thing called um, Revolution Ply, which is essentially Luan, but it's got a weird formulation. Of, uh, for some reason, uh, you can't cut it with a laser cutter. Uh, which is a real uh, sort of weird situation. Anywho, um, yeah. So there's lots of different there's lots of different places that you can do uh, the, lots of different surfaces that you can paint on. But the majority of what you're going to paint on is going to be either Luan or plywood or muslin. Um, and muslin has the advantage of being super cheap, which is great because these days everything is so darn expensive in at Home Depot. Um, all right, so then, and I see that time is getting a little short, so I'm going to speed this up slightly. Oh, I didn't do the individual planks in there. Oh, well, we'll, we'll do that in a second. Let's just sort of think it through. So, like, that's a plank. And then let's do... Jared? Yes. What, uh, as you say, is the most recommended lighting to paint under? Uh, well, I mean, uh, what we have here at the shop, in fact, what we're painting underneath are theater lights. Um, uh, if you can paint under the, um, under the same lighting conditions that will be in the space, that's ideal. That is not always the case. Um, uh, so a lot of times you just have to sort of um, go with what, what is there. Um, I, I will say that it, I painted some stuff outside one time 
Um, and when I got it into the theater, it did not look like uh, it should have um, because it was, it's very bright outside usually. Um, and so uh, I would not recommend painting outside if your show is going to be indoors. Um, but you're doing Shakespeare in the Park or something like that, feel free uh, to paint outside. Okay, so now we've got to this stage. Um, normally, we would, we would wait, and then uh, we would let this dry, and then we would do a glaze over it, um, uh, which would be, in fact, just a very watery version of Payne's Gray. And that would uh, uh, create a certain amount of depth um, the color, the, the, uh, the two colors that are here would uh, shine through that, that, that glaze, that uh, skin of color, um, uh, the transparent, uh, watery uh, uh, Payne's gray um, in the first place. But unfortunately, we do not have time for that. But uh, what I can show you is the kind of the, the, the very last step, um, which is adding highlights. Because uh, like I said, I think that we are getting... We're getting pretty close to the wire here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you want to pick a direction that the light is coming from. Um, uh, I'm going to pick uh, that it's coming from up, up above over this way, um, uh, seeing as that's the top of the flat. Uh, and uh, so what you're, what you're doing is you want to paint uh, with white where the, the, uh, the light is going to hit it, hit any raised surface. The most raised surface that we have is the top of this lintel. So I'm just going to throw the brush down, pull it towards me, and round off the corner on the top there. So that is, and I'm going to actually, because I was saying that the light is coming from here, let's do that. Make it a little, a little, a little more. Uh, rustic and we can do a little bit of that sort of thing where we just sort of bobble the brush back and forth um, then we can take this plank let's take uh, yeah let's do this plank so we'll take this plank and we go across the top we sort of start and stop a little bit and then let's just say that there was a split in the in the plank we want to take this and run it down the side of the split. So now it sort of appears as if this uh, plank has split at this point right here. Um, uh, that is, a, that is a, a, a way to do it. And in fact, let's, let's do another split um, here on the lintel. And we'll do another, another split, split right there. Uh, and uh, we can go back in later with a with a darker color to make that uh, that split a little darker. Uh, all right, and then this is another point that sticks out of from the doorway, right there. And then we do another one here on the Z, and another one here. And um, we'll do the split here between these two planks. Uh, so that really makes it look like that plank is coming up. And then, um, and then let's, uh, since the light is coming this way, this, uh, this very edge can get a piece of, uh, can get white. And I'm just sort of running it along the side here. And then this side can get a very thin plank and we can do it again uh jared yes uh can you sort of explain a little bit about how the colors you chose there sort of the color palette how they all sort of came together here like how it all blends together right so um so Basically, I was going uh, again. The uh, the what you're seeing here is not what it would would normally be. Um, uh, uh, there is another step that we're missing here, where when this is dry, you can do a glaze over it, and it sort of locks everything together. 
um, uh, and that the colors shine through. So you could have, depending on, depending on what type of wood you uh, envision as being the wood on this old barn, um, uh, different, type, different types of wood. But usually you want to have a relative earth tone. It can be a, uh, this is a yellow ochre, but it could be a uh, raw umber or a uh, uh, burnt sienna, um, any of those sort of um, earth tones. You know, sort of, there's some that are more red, there's some that are more yellow. Uh, so, et cetera. And then you kind of want something on the other side of the color wheel just to give you another tone. Um, uh, often uh, lighting designers will thank you for this because uh, if you have kind of just the same tone everywhere, for example, if you had a red wall and your lighting designer throws a red light on it, it doesn't look like anything. Um, uh, but if there are multiple colors, and there usually are in a show, um, uh, you're guaranteed to have something catch the light uh, in the process if you keep um, uh, colors sort of uh, in a general way um, in the um, opposite sides of the color wheel, if that makes any sense. Um, so like blue and yellow are on opposite sides of the color wheel. Um, okay. We are getting, we're getting close to it. Um, uh, unfortunately, like I said, it, it, it all takes um, more time than you think. Uh, this time has really flown by, and I want to thank everybody who has uh, tuned in today uh, to be able to see this. Our hope is to take this video and edit it down into a much shorter uh, sort of thing. I may redo it so that <laughs> we can have a nice, um, uh, not soupy uh, uh, sort of uh, demonstration for you guys. But uh, but uh, I'm really uh, thankful for you all to be uh, coming tonight, and um, and I hope that uh, you guys learned a little bit of something about the uh, about the wood graining process. So again, thank you very much for coming. I'm Jared Davis for Inside the Scenic Studio, live. <laughs>